meat is bad for you, it harms the environment, it is immoral and bad. Where do these messages come from and why have we been told these things for so many years? The answers might actually surprise you, so stay tuned. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Sarah. I am known as Carnivore Yogi. Thank you so much for being here and clicking on today's video. Today, I have on the podcast Belinda Fetke, who is the wife of Dr. Gary Fetke, who actually lost the ability to practice medicine as well as speak out on the internet about his views on nutrition because he told a diabetic patient to stop eating sugar because he essentially didn't want to amputate this person's foot. So why the heck did this happen? And why did Dr. Fetke have to go through years of litigation? Well, his wife, Belinda, who is an absolutely wonderful and delightful person, I interviewed her and we spoke about where these nutritional guidelines come from. Belinda devoted her life to uncovering a lot of things. And this episode, I do have timestamps in the information section because there's a lot of things that we dive into about the messaging around food. The story is a lot more bizarre than you would think. So if you have not heard this information before, I encourage you to listen to the whole thing. You, you can again go and look in the timestamps and check out the different topics, but we go through a lot. We talk even about yoga in here and where that messaging comes from as well. So I hope it's extremely helpful. I may take this episode and divide it up a little bit into sections. I just want this message to get out to more people because I feel like for so long we have been fed a message about food that is completely not based on science. And this episode really, really delves into all of that. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I do want to thank the sponsor of today's episode, which is going to be Upgraded Formulas. If you're anything like me, you do like to make sure the supplements that you're taking actually work, that you're absorbing them, that you're not getting too much of something and throwing off the balance of other things. And then also it's nice to know if you are dealing with a lot of heavy metals in your body. That's why I love Upgraded Formulas Hair Tissue Mineral Analysis. I have personally used it every 90 days for the last year at this point to make sure that again, I'm not taking too many supplements and that I actually have the correct mineral balance in my body so that I can absorb things properly. I can absorb the regular nutrients and vitamins out of my food. If you don't have proper mineral balance, it's going to be really hard for you to process a lot of your other foods and absorb your other nutrients. So you can use my code YOGI12 over at Upgraded Formulas. Follow the link in the information section and save on anything on the Upgraded Formulas website, including their magnesium, which is my absolute favorite supplement that I will never give up unless, of course, my hair test says that I have too much magnesium, which hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so make sure you head on over to Upgraded Formulas to test and not guess. It is not a great idea to just supplement blindly because somebody on a podcast says that you need these particular supplements. So check out Upgraded Formulas. Again, link in the information section and my discount code is YOGI12. I hope you guys enjoy this episode with Belinda Fetke. Again, feel free to hop on into the information section and look at all the different topics that we have that are time stamped into chapters. I hope you guys enjoy this. I'll talk with you again soon. Bye. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming back and tuning into this episode. I'm extremely excited about today's guest. She has quite a wonderful story about how she really started to understand how our nutritional guidelines are set up and presented to us. It's very compelling. Um, thank you, Belinda, for being here today. Thanks so much, Sarah, for having me. Yeah. So you, if you wouldn't mind just introducing my audience a little bit to you, I will do a little pre-roll before, you know, the, the conversation starts, but just telling people yes. a little bit about you and your husband and, and how you got into studying nutritional guidelines. It's, it's a very unexpected story. Um, you're aware of where I've been. I guess, I guess the very beginning of our story is Gary's own health journey. Mm. And that was around 2000. He was diagnosed with a, pituit a very aggressive pituitary tumor. And 
he went on to chemotherapy or he had surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and then he just kept getting sicker and sicker, Sarah. He was having to add in you know, high blood pressure. He was complications of the chemotherapy. He was developing GERD, um, which is a gastrointestinal reflux. Or, and he was just getting sicker. And we, we watched his progression. 2004, he had more surgery. And, and as time went on, he just started to say, look, what, what can I do to help myself? Like, he is a doctor, an orthopedic surgeon. Right. So he has had the same basic training as all other doctors, even though you might think, well, surgeon might not have to think about nutrition. So he's, he's pottering along going, um, so there was a, a book that came out here in Australia called Sweet Poison. It's written mm-hmm. by a lawyer. David Gillespie. And at the, around the time, Gary, starting to hear little rumblings around 2011 about maybe sugar was contributing to the growth of cancer. He'd gotten in touch with Dominic D'Agostino yes. and um, Colin Champ in the US and was having a little bit of a discussion. And this book came out and Gary thought, well, what does a lawyer know about sugar that I don't know as a doctor? So he read the book and then he just started to think about reducing sugar in his own diet. And so it started there. And then he started to think about the polyunsaturated oils and, you know, why are we eating polyunsaturated oils when for millennia we've <laughs> eaten animal proteins and fats? Yeah. So he, he just, yeah, started just changing the way he was eating. And of course that was coming into our own eating patterns in our family as well. But I guess as time went on, he started to reverse his prediabetes. He reversed his um, high blood pressure and he was able to come off chemotherapy which was was amazing at the time because it had made him so sick mm. and just watching his own journey. So I'm not saying that surgery, radiotherapy and the chemo weren't important at the time because he was diagnosed when it was quite um, advanced. And so it was really important for him to have those things. But unfortunately, diet was never discussed. Mm. And in the beginning, in fact, they would encourage him because he, had, he developed um, a side effect of the surgery and the tumor that was called diabetes insipidus, which is very different to the normal diabetes that everyone's aware of, sugar diabetes. And this diabetes means that you can't concentrate your urine. And so you produce Mm. a lot of urine and you can get very dry. So you have to drink a lot to maintain your um, water balance. And Gary was told in hospital when he needed to drink eight to 12 liters a day at the beginning, because it was just out of control, to drink fruit juice because it wouldn't be as boring. So here we are, a man with a recently diagnosed cancer, and he was drinking eight to 12 litres a day, and I would say four to six litres of that would have been fruit juice just to oh. break up the thing. So he was just pouring sugar into his body, unfortunately, from people who told him that's what he should do. So as he started to look more and more into the sugar aspect, um, he was looking at metformin because he is an orthopaedic surgeon. He's specifically looking after a lot of people with the complications of type 2 diabetes, metabolic disease, Mm. inflammatory disorders. And he was thinking metformin specifically takes the sugar out of the blood vessels and pushes them into the tissues, which is great when you look at blood tests because there's no sugar in the blood, but not necessarily over the long term of what that blood, uh, what that glucose is doing to the actual tissues but that's more of Gary's talk than mine, so <laughs> I won't go there. But, you know, that's the, that's the basic concept of it. Yeah. And he thought, why would I take another medication? Why would I be recommending people take metformin when potentially they could reduce their sugar intake? So that's how he started. And he said, okay, I might not have been taught nutrition specifically for very, I think what, they had maybe two hours or something ridiculous on nutrition. But he said, if you consider that I have studied for Uh, specifically three years they spent on anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry. That is nutrition, really. We understand um, homeostasis, gluconeogenesis, you know, all of those things that result in your body, energy in, energy out, all of those things. And he said, I do understand this. I'm looking at what's called the Krebs cycle, and Mm. that's where your mitochondria gets fueled. He said, we don't need carbohydrates We don't need processed carbohydrates in our diet. So he started to talk to his patients about this. And specifically, he spoke to a patient in hospital who was at that time having a debridement of non-healing foot ulcers. 
because mm-hmm. there's no way antibiotics don't work for complications of type 2 diabetes. And so this poor person, more and more bits of flesh was being cut off their foot mm. and potentially going to have to have a, an amputation. And he told this person, let's just try and get control of your blood glucose in hospital right now. I'd really love you to consider reducing the sugar. The menu that's just carb and sugar loaded yes. in this hospital or the things that they're offering you, specifically breakfast. And so he was reported by a dietitian who was looking after people with type 2 diabetes and organising their menus. He was reported to the medical board in 2014 because of this person that he told. Oh. Or, sorry, weren't told he wasn't told. He recommended right. they reduce sugar. Because they didn't want and to have to amputate the foot, right? <laughs> I he, mean. Wanted their ulcer, he wanted them to heal. Right. And their blood glucose was out of control. So oh. every time they were eating high sugary carbohydrate meals, their blood glucose would go up. Then they would need to be checked by a nurse. They'd have to have their blood glucose checked. Then they'd need to call a, a resident or registrar in to, redu- you know, to write up more insulin. And Gary, this is a, a ridiculous Thing that's happening out of control is costing the health system besides costing this patient their life it's costing the health system so much why don't we reduce the sugar look at all the sugar around us he started yeah. at being a public health advocate for reducing the um amount of sugar in hospital menus and also the um the junk food that was being sold to these people you know the the pink ladies are amazing and they do a fantastic job but they bring around carts of junk food once or twice a day to sell yes. to people who are stuck in bed. And when I was a nurse eons ago <laughs> and Gary first started medicine, the pink ladies used to bring around cigarettes. Wow. And then they worked out that the harms of cigarettes were complicating people's recovery. And so they stopped selling them. Well, Gary was on this public health campaign saying, well, I think sugar is causing as much harm to my patients as cigarettes did. And they should, and it should not be sold to my patients who are in bed trying to recover or trying to get better from these issues, and certainly for surgery. So that's where he started. He got reported to the medical board, and unbelievably, the medical board investigated him for two and a half years. Oh, wow! Talking, initially talking about sugar, but as time went on, he he was researching more and more and finding out more. So he was offering the medical board pretty much a thesis over that two and a half years of all the research that he was gathering up together. He'd highlight all the important parts of each research article. He just kept sending it to them and they did nothing. Wow. And so here we had a group called um, Low Carb Down Under. Yes. So a group of doctors were starting to get together and, and scientists and dietitians and all sorts of people. And I was watching them literally talk themselves blue in the face. Then Gary got reported and I just said to them, I hate to tell you, but I don't think this is about the science. I actually don't think what you're presenting, I mean, it is the science and it is improving people's health, but the people who are writing the guidelines, people who are in charge of protecting the rule books, they're not listening to this information. And so I guess I started to do a bit of a deep dive thinking, what the hell's wrong with this? Why, why is this not being considered? Mm -hmm. And that's where that's where I started going down the vested interests and the religious ideology that are shaping guidelines and how far back do they go and and I you know I've got a few taglines and you you know well no doubt will know them but you know I say it's a very plant biased dietary mm-hmm. and health guidelines now yeah. and the more I looked into it so it's it it also started with the um, the expert witness that was called in to the medical board to determine if Gary could talk about sugar as an orthopedic surgeon. And I thought, why is one of the highest ranking Emirate professors of the South Pacific Asia you know, division, why is someone so high, the biggest gun in nutrition pretty much, who actually writes textbooks for dietitians being called in to determine if a, an orthopedic surgeon in Tasmania, like we live at the bottom of Australia, one step away from Antarctica, Wow. There's 120,000 people, catchment area. It's tiny where we live. Why is he being brought in wow. to determine if this is important or not? And so I thought he must work for the sugar industry. That was, that was the obvious conclusion. No, why is someone so determined that Gary can't talk about this? 
And I honestly thought at the beginning, it's all about low carb. It's all about reducing sugar. It's about processed carbohydrates. Who, who are we offending in this space? Who's Gary stepping on toes with? And he wasn't working for the sugar industry, but he was working for the cereal industry. Ah. So, of course, that started yep. to make sense. And then I did a bit more digging and over these two and a half years while Gary was being investigated, I was just honed in on, I guess, where this man had come from, who he was working for, what research he'd produced, you know, where he sat in all of this. And I was also looking at just the cereal industry, I guess. And I discovered that he worked for a particular cereal industry here in Australia called Sanitarium. And as time's gone on, I found out he pretty much worked consecutively for them and it could go even further back, but the way back archive machine (laughs) takes me very comfortably back to 2000. So he was working from 2000 to 2016 for Sanitarium, which is a cereal company very much like Kellogg's. Mm. But like Kellogg's, they also produce um, the soy milks, the alternative milks here, and they also produce a lot of alternative meat products. So mm-hmm. the vegetable patties, the you know, the fake meats. So yeah, I got, okay. I uncovered documents stating Gary was targeted for active defence by the cereal industry, a group of cereal industries. So we've got Kellogg's, Sanitarium, Nestle, and a group called Freedom Foods here in Australia, and they were they called themselves the Australian Breakfast Cereal Manufacturing Forum, and a hashtag cereal for brekkie and this group had gotten together every month and worked out at what well, they worked out a whole lot of marketing issues but they worked out that low carb down under and specifically gary fetke was harming cereal sales and wow. he was the only medical doctor targeted they were on the internet i mean i don't know how to hack into things i don't know who'd put them up or who had the who made the mistake of letting it leak out onto the internet. But I got these minuted documents for, um, I probably got about four or five, told a few of my friends who were much better at finding things on the internet. And they gathered what we called the serial or the WikiLeaks, but the Wheaty Leaks <laughs> of all these documents. And yeah, for a couple of years, they were paying the Dietitians Association of Australia at that time, $23,000 a year wow. to use their dietitians to influence, protect, and actively defend cereal, grains, and sugar. And the dietitians had no idea. So we've got a group of people who totally trust their accrediting body to be providing them with educational material that is actually, you know, that's, I don't know, fully referenced, whatever else. You you expect your regulatory body, your accrediting body, and your educational body to be giving you the best information not to be partnering with a group of cereal companies. Right. And then, and then giving your dietitians you know, information that's been influenced and shaped by vested interests. And I just stunned. I, I spoke to a couple of dietitians at the time, said, did you have any idea that your body's doing this, that the Dietitians Association of Australia is being influenced by the cereal industry? And that this is shocking, Yes, this, this targeting. So after um, I didn't uncover these documents, unfortunately, until after, quite well after Gary was reported, but certainly within this period of us challenging the medical board and saying, you know, what the hell? So we went back into that and Gary was given, I think, 865 pages of unsubstantiated vexatious documents collated by um, the medical director at the hospital that he was working at. And within these documents, we found around that time of this Cyril Fabrecki group targeting Gary, that the CEO at the time was writing to Gary's hospital, asking for him to be silenced. So it seems like it was just, you know, absolute collusion happening here. And and everyone was playing along. Wow. So we fought and fought and it took four and a half years for the determinate or four and a half years from the start of him being reported to him actually being exonerated of all vexatious charges. But that's a long time for a doctor who was talking about improving health to be under the, he became the only medical doctor in the world, silenced from talking about nutrition for two years. Wow. 
And that's, you know, what's what I'm seeing is obvious that he was just trying to help, you know, that he saw such dramatic improvements in his own health after facing cancer. I mean, a horrible cancer. It sounds like he was incredibly ill and able to use nutrition as an adjunct therapy to the radiation and the chemotherapy. And it was dramatic of what happened to him. And so as a doctor, knowing that he wants to help people now, he's being punished for, for simply trying to help his patients, which is just unbelievable. Especially when you see how incredible reducing sugar and processed carbohydrates is in the management of type 2 diabetes. Like it's yeah. unbelievable. You know, it, it can be prevented and even reversed. And as you would know, the data is coming out more and more all the time. And the... American Diabetes Association, I think they've actually come out now saying that low carbohydrate can be one of the tools used. But when Gary first started talking about it in 2011, 2012, it was heresy. And and it still is being really strongly denied here in Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's starting to creep in a tiny, tiny bit, but it's just why isn't it just jumping out? You know, right. and why aren't doctors just going, this just makes so much sense. Yeah. It's unbelievable. When you and I can work it out. Yeah. And you know, we live in this kind of bubble, you and I, of people who we understand, we see it. We've seen hundreds, if not more people who have changed their life and reversed mm. all types of health conditions. Um, but I feel like still mainstream, a lot of friends of mine and people who they don't know about this platform and they don't know about this lifestyle, yeah. they still don't believe and they don't know that things like type two diabetes is reversible. Like that's mm. very common that people just don't even know that that can even happen. And so it's, yeah, it's unbelievable. When I first started nursing and when Gary was a younger medical doctor, he might see someone who required debridement of their foot ulcers or an amputation only once or twice a year. This mm. is 20, 30 years ago, like 30 years ago, once or twice a year. And we considered type 2 diabetes to be maturity onset diabetes. That's what it was called. And most people didn't get type 2 diabetes until they were about retirement age. Mm. So the government didn't take it nearly as seriously because it didn't affect you know, people who were working. It didn't affect people for very long. And often the complications, people have died before they got really bad complications. So it wasn't considered that serious a disease 30 years ago in comparison to what we're seeing now with younger and younger people getting type 2 diabetes and the complications happening so much younger. Yeah. And and it's and it is debilitating. You lose a leg, you lose two legs. You, that transition to that period and, and eyesight and kidneys and everything else that occurs with these complications, it is not only costing individuals and their families and their in their communities, their workplace, but it is costing our healthcare budget exorbitant amounts. And you look at hospital menus and they are just a, a train wreck. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. You know, this public health advocacy became very, very important to Gary and important to a lot of other people, as you say, yourself included. You know, why, but why should we be doing this? Why aren't the associations that protect people are supposed to be protecting people with diabetes and heart? cancer, all these associations appear to be protecting this plant biased dietary guidelines. Yes. And as time went on, I started to realize that cereal for brekkie is very, very powerful. And our guidelines weren't, Gary wasn't only in trouble for telling people to reduce sugar and processed carbs. He was in just as much trouble for telling people, recommending to people, I keep saying telling, sorry, it's always recommendation. Yes. I, I get yes. a bit excited. No, I <laughs> recommending, understand. Yeah. Recommending to people that they should include or th- consider including um, animal proteins and fats in their diet because he knows that those things help people heal. Yes. And that, that was his fundamental thing. You know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I need to reduce the risk and improve the health outcomes. And for me, people need protein to be improving their health. Like tissues need protein to rebuild. And before we understood that these plant biased dietary guidelines were in place and they weren't just flexible, which he always thought guidelines were flexible. You know, you see what works best and you move and you, you consider that, but you move within that space, but they've become rule books. 
Mm. Because why else would a doctor be in trouble for four and yes. a half years? And Tim Noakes in South Africa was the same. These yes. doctors were in trouble for seeing the light, for understanding how important these things were. So that made me start to consider Sanitarium, the cereal company that this um, expert witness had worked for. And then looking through at what he was doing, I thought, okay, Sanitarium. And I started to click. Well, Sanitarium is wholly owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Australia. Mm. And vaguely aware, they have a very, very small footprint in Australia and New Zealand compared to the footprint that they have in America. Very small in the UK as well. So we've only got one major hospital owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church here. I think in America, there's 28 in Florida alone. So it's a very big healthcare system over there. Here we've got the one hospital, a few smaller private hospitals, but all based in New South Wales um, around Sydney. And they've got this major food industry that they have here. And I would say it's a hub for a lot of the world. I know it took over um, Loma Linda Loma Linda's food production for quite a long time that's not owned by the church anymore but sanitarium is very very big and as I say they make cereals they make alternative milks and they send that into the UK into North America into Canada and into India specifically in a really big way their alternative milks and then they also make alternative meats so you look onto Sanitarium's health and wellbeing website, because that's what they call themselves, Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing Company, and the Sanitarium Food Company, and you look on their website and it's very, very grain, cereal, alternative, you know, anti-animal proteins and fats, but it's not. It's, it's a very subtle health and wellness website. But they also own the Alternative Meat Company website or the Life Health Foods website website and you go to those ones and it's very very anti-animal proteins anti-animal fats it's very much along the vegan propaganda line of talking about how bad cows are for the environment and how much water they use and I've gone specifically in a couple of my talks looking at Australia and and their allegations or their accusations really about how bad animals are and where they're suggesting that we should be, you know, just planting all these crops, a lot of Australia is desert and a lot of our animals are raised in areas where they eat natural habit, uh, eat natural vegetation and have natural rainfall. If we planted crops into all of those desert areas, the water would be like exorbitant. Like we could not grow crops in a lot of these places. So they say, oh, you know, people are, eating more and more plants. So that means that a third of Australia is now vegan. And it's like, um, I eat a plant-based diet. <laughs> I've swapped all my calves to plants. Right. I've gotten, <laughs> yeah, gotten rid of the rice and the pasta and all of those things. Yeah. And I eat lots of fresh green leafy veggies and I do have some sweet potato. But, you know, uh, you know we have vegetables instead of calves, but I still eat animal proteins and fats. And so I think it's, it's very misleading, a lot of their marketing. So and that was a little jump to a side, but you know, I started to look more and more into them. And so I thought, okay, well, what are the Seventh-day Adventist Church advocating and, and why are they advocating this? And so I've gone a huge jump right back. At, and over the last seven and a half years, I've looked right into religions and where veganism and vegetarianism come from. And, and I've got a huge storage of information in my head and it's way too much for most people in fact it's way too much for me half the time too but I think it's really important before I delve into any further that I say that I'm not anti-veganism I'm not anti-vegetarianism certainly not anti-religion I really respect people's choice and their beliefs and my concern is though that through the dietary guidelines that my choice our choice is being taken away to eat animal proteins and fats because of the people, the vested interests, the religious ideology, ideology that is shaping our dietary and health guidelines. So that's my concern. It's becoming an exclusive and ignoring ancestral diets. I agree. And, and it's so insidious how 
people just take it as word. And I did the same thing. I thought, you know, when I first became a yoga teacher that the healthiest diet and the most nonviolent diet was going to be a vegan diet. And I did it until it failed me in my health. And uh, it just, yeah. And then when I started actually eating meat, I felt like it was my responsibility to understand the truth. And that's where yes. I really uncovered your work and uncovered, and I appreciate it so much. That's why I wanted to bring you on here because I just don't think people really understand where this plant-based message is coming from and the true implications of it, you know, and I, you know, speaking of cereal, there's so, there's such a broad topic, but I grew up <laughs> And cereal and milk, cereal and milk was every breakfast and then snack after school and yes. <laughs> loved cereal. You know, I'm, I'm grew up in the eighties and the nineties as my childhood born in 79. And so, yeah, we had cereal every day. I'm same with my husband. And now the way that we eat, we don't eat, we don't have any cereal. My daughter's almost 14 and she's never had cereal before because of how we eat. Um, yes. And I was just thinking that today, I'm like, wow, you know, that was just such a huge part of my life. But then when I actually heard where this whole cereal thing came from, I was just flabbergasted. So if yeah. You, yeah, exactly. So yeah. where did the cereal industry come from? Right. Where, yeah. I think, where, when did we decide that processed carbohydrates were health food? Yes. And that uh, and adequate this, uh, to, give, <laughs> to start your you, day, to start your day yeah, when you, you need walk the, in the, your brain and, and everything to yeah. start to turn on and energy for the day. And you have mm -hmm. this devoid of nutrients, you know, thing you put in a bowl with, you know, skim milk. <laughs> and the dietitians associations support it. Not only yeah. do they support, but they advocate it. And you think, yeah. And now what it's almond milk this? or soy milk or, you know, yes. some nut, <clears throat> nut milk, which when you talk about the environmental implications of an almond milk, it's like, mm -hmm. are we really doing anything good? So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't, I, think, I don't know where you want to start with all of that. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to start with the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, because I think her statement is amazing she came to us so she founded the seventh day adventist church with her husband and a group of people in 1863 but it'd been developing for about 20 years it had been rumbling along and getting stronger and stronger and so 1863 in battle creek michigan the birthplace of kellogg's and the cereal industry um that's where they founded their church and she came to Australia in 1891 to 1900 to set up the church here. And she also wrote the health food business. So she wrote this, the health food business is to take the place or is to provide the people with food, which will take the place of meat, milk, eggs, and butter. Wow. And so she came here to set up sanitarium and it was to be based on Kellogg's cereal model based on Kellogg's and and so it's set up here but this time the church would own it so okay let's take a step back now why Kellogg's why was she so interested in this well John Harvey Kellogg whom I'm sure everyone or most people have heard of John Harvey Kellogg was 12 years old when he first went to work for the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church so when he first went to work as a typesetter for their literature evangelism because that was how we've got digital technology now and we can talk to each other all over the world but they had to use pamphlets they had to use books they had to use you know how do we tell people about our message about the church it was very much literacy evangelism and so he was typesetting their their pamphlets their health things because the church lng white decided health was a very important part of the visions that she was given from God. She was given over 2000 visions and dreams in her lifetime of how to support and testimonies for her church. Um, I guess every new church needs a new doctrine. So for her specifically, she was told that the garden of Eden diet, fruits, grains, nuts, and seeds were the God appointed diet for man. And so she believed that meat eating was harmful and not only was it harmful, but it was sinful because it wasn't what we were given in the Garden of Eden. And we only started eating meat 
when after, or she believes that God gave the direction, we're only allowed to eat meat after the flood. And that's when our our sinful lives, if we partook of meat, would be diseased and shortened. So here we've got a 12-year-old boy coming in and typesetting her sermons about meat. And the very first book he typeset, so he typeset a lot of pamphlets and other things, but the first book was called A Solemn Appeal or A Solemn Appeal to Mothers. It had a couple of different names, but A Solemn Appeal was wholly and solely about deterring mothers from giving their children meat, from from deterring their children from masturbating. And they believed eating meat um, aroused basal passions, it excited nerves, it did all those things that by giving their children a bland diet of fruits, grains, nuts and seeds, that they would not masturbate. And that was considered the most heinous sin of all time at that time. Wow. So (laughs) we've got a young boy who's typesetting not only a sermon about how bad masturbating is, but tying that in with animal proteins and fats. You know, it wasn't completely anti-milk and butter and eggs right at the beginning because they didn't have anything to substitute it with. But she said there will come a time when we can provide substitutes for these things because we've got to get them out of the diet. We've got to get back to the original diet that God appointed for man. And so here's John Harvey Kellogg writing what happens when you eat meat and you masturbate. And it was everything from you lose your eyesight to your head decays. And she said it was if you put a pistol to your heart and pulled the trigger and took your life instantly. That's how bad meat eating was considered to be. It was wow. sinful and it, and it ruined your entire life. So after typesetting for her for at least four years, and then he became a teacher at first, but then the church offered to pay for him to become a medical doctor because they opened the Western Health Reform Institute in 1876 or 1874, sorry, in 1876, he took it over. Well, actually, maybe in 10 years. It was only about 40 people. In 1876, he took it over as the medical superintendent. And so for the next few years, he's trying to work out how he can provide food for these people that would sustain them, but it would reduce their basal passions. (laughs) They went there to learn how to eat a vegetarian meal. So he... He did ferment milk, but otherwise it was completely animal protein and fat free. He believed butter was very bad. He No grease was allowed to be used. Wow. So he set up an experimental kitchen. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of Battle Creek Sanitarium, but it's really worthwhile Googling. You look at when it was the Western Health Reform Institute with about 40 people, it grew to a place under John Harvey Kellogg to take 1,200 people each week with a 700 support staff. Like it was, it was the start of what we consider a, the Western hospital system. It was massive, unbelievable. And so he developed this experimental kitchen to work out how he could make food to take the place of flesh meat, milk, butter, and eggs. He married a woman and I haven't, I, and this is where my research, which I find is totally fascinating, can I just say, understanding the history of where our nutrition guidelines have come from yes. is just, is so important because if you don't look at the historical aspects and how influential the cereal industry and Ellen G. White's writings have been, it's really hard to understand where this anti-meat messaging has come from further yes. on. So looking at, you know, how he married a woman called Ella Eaton, and I think they got married in about <clears throat> maybe 1878, round about then. She was one of the very first home economic teachers. And home economics at the time was the lead into dietetics. But they were looking specifically at food because people had gone from making everything themselves to start to moving into cities and buying things. So home economics was more looking at the cost of food and how people could still, I don't know, how, how women could maintain their budgets. What could they still make? You know, what were the ingredients in some of the things? They're looking at how processing was being done. And there was some questioning certainly about the, the conditions 
of how food was being produced as well. But she and John Harvey Kellogg developed one of the very first dietetic trainings at Battle Creek Sanitarium. But in their experimental kitchen, oh, they were doing all sorts of things. They're making nut butters and instead of normal butter, they were using peanut butter. <clears throat> he didn't actually invent peanut butter, but he, he was the first person to patent it. Ah. And so as time went on, I think in the late 1890s, they flaked corn and flaked wheat for the first time with John Harvey Kellogg's brother as well. So the three of them worked out the invention of flaked wheat. They went on to John Harvey Kellogg um, created the very first nuttos and then went on to protos. So this legume-based protein in a can, you know, gooey gelatinous stuff that he was starting to create, everything to try to take the place of flesh meat, milk, eggs and butter. He was one of the very first advocates of soy for human food and he spoke at the Soy Bean Association saying how important it was for them to start to consider, you know, what an opportunity, let's make soy for people in the 1900s. So while the Eastern religions and or, so Eastern cultures had used soy in some consideration, it was fermented soy they were mm. using, not processed soy that we started to eat in Western world. So very, very different how, how it was interpreted. And I think we've been told that Eastern civilizations have been vegetarian, 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 or vegan, you know, almost vegan promoting, but not a single ancient civilization or culture has been devoid of all animal proteins and fats because they couldn't get all their essential vitamins and minerals. And they, they understood that. So even Jain religion, which is probably one of the strictest religions in the world about what they eat yes. and what they don't eat, they won't even pull up a potato or an onion because they don't want to harm a plant because that would kill a plant. They have yak butter in their tea because they have to have some sort of animal protein and fat. So here's John Harvey Kellogg trying to work out how to get rid of it all. And he is so influential in creating this dietetic training program. He was in, so influential in creating fake foods or processed foods right at the very beginning. And one of his protégés, um, a, a woman called Lena Cooper, she actually was one of the founders of the American Dietetic Association. And she came in, her brothers were devout Adventists. It's considered that she was an Adventist, but certainly she was educated under the Battle Creek Sanitarium mod module of you know, getting rid of animal proteins and fats. She allowed some lean meat and a little bit of dairy in some of the books that she wrote as textbooks, but in all of her recipe books, she was the very first dietitian working for a food industry because her recipe books were how to cook nuttos, how to cook protos, how to cook John Harvey Kellogg's inventions, how to include those in cooking. And she wrote the dietetic textbooks for about 30 years. Wow. And so if you start to look at how influential this group have been in getting rid of animal proteins and fats over time, and there was a guy called Reese Southern that I came across pretty early on in my research, and he had the most extensively researched website I've ever seen going all the way back. He'd gone through so many Adventist archives because all of it, not all of it, a huge percentage percentage of it is online and accessible to anybody, but it's you know, hundreds of thousands of pages. He's gone through a hell of a lot of it, working out who was involved in creating the vegetarian research, uh, resource papers and getting vegetarianism back accepted back into the American Dietetic Association. So I, I got a lot of my information from him. So I thought, well, if they're doing all of that in America, what are they doing in Australia? How can I tie this into what I'm seeing is happening to Gary and what I see is this plant bias dietary guidelines here in Australia as well. So looking at their vegetarian um, position paper, I discovered, which has since been removed off the website, of course, because it's very embarrassing to the, the um, Australian or the Dietitians Association of Australia, that all of their references were from Sanitarium, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, and Kellogg's. 
So you know, the cereal industry were writing the vegetarian position papers. And I'm not saying that maybe there shouldn't be something from the Seventh-day Adventist church because they've spent the last 150 years working out how to potentially be healthy, eating a vegetarian or vegan diet, but they shouldn't be writing all of the, all of the research and all of the resources should not come from the cereal industry saying, of course, it's healthy because it's a very biased view in my opinion. So looking at how this has come about, um, you may be aware that in the recent 2020 US Dietary Guidelines Committee, um, Nina Teicholz with her Nutrition Coalition was looking at the vested interests and the ideology shaping those guidelines. So uh, there's a guy called um, Joan Spatz. So uh, most of the panel had ties to what's called ILSI, or the International Life Sciences Institute, which was founded by Coca-Cola in 1978, or the head, the vice president of Coca-Cola. <clears throat> and he set up this amazing um, research institute. So, but it's if you look at who the members are, they were the food, pharmaceutical, and even at the beginning, the tobacco industry were setting up these research um, hub so that they could provide research to dietitians, to doctors, to health professionals on the importance of including, or well, I say their intent was public health messaging, minimizing the harms of sugar and processed foods. And at the beginning, minimizing tobacco as well. And of course, the, the pharmaceutical industry love it because the sicker we get, the more they can band aid sick care. So yeah. the Dietitians Association really have been educated by the food industry and medicine's been educated by the pharmaceutical industry. And these groups are intent on protecting profits. And whether that was their in, the intent was to harm people, I'm not suggesting that for any moment, but unfortunately their intent on minimising the harms of sugar and carbs and everything else profits them and unfortunately does end up in this terrible healthcare system that's simply band-aiding sick care. And when people start to question that and are calling that out and saying we should be reducing these things and reducing medication, deprescribing, of course we're harming their profits and we become targets and, and we become, uh, you know, this is, this is a fad diet, this is this, this is that. And, and they're, they're trying to call us out as they did with the tobacco industry back in the 1980s, yep. 70s and 80s. But I think the tobacco industry are truly only using sugar industry tactics if you go back even further because people weren't concerned about harms of tobacco in the 1940s. But mm -mm. from the 1910, when the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, Harvey Wiley was concerned about the sugar in Coca-Cola even then, really? about the caffeine. <clears throat> so he was trying, he struggled to overcome Coca-Cola back in 19, 1906, I think the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed. And he ended up leaving his position in, within the government and went and worked for a women's health magazine because he was sick of trying to fight Coca-Cola and he worked out he could influence people better, influence the women that he wanted to get to with his messaging better from a health, women's health magazine than he could trying to do anything legislative. So the sugar industry, Coca-Cola, has been influential in writing guidelines all the way back for so long and, and blocking any legislation to question the harms of sugar all the way back then. And I discovered through my research that in about 1940, 43, 46, there was a guy called Mervyn Harding who was working at or studying at the College of Medical Evangelists. And that was owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's since become Loma Linda University. So the College of Medical Evangelists, he was also working as a researcher in the um, International Nutrition Science Laboratory which was founded by a devout Adventist. And they, his actual wording in numerous papers that Reith Southern was able to locate said that our research is to prove 
not disprove divine inspiration and how incredible that we have this opportunity to create food that will take the place of flesh meat, milk, butter, cheese, eggs. Unbelievable that this whole research was set up. So then Mervyn Harding's doing a doctoral thesis and he goes to Harvard to be supervised for this because he wanted his papers to prove that vegetarianism was safe. And he's he went to Frederick Stair. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware or your um, audience is aware, there's a guy called Fred Stair. He was the head of the School of Public Health at Harvard University. And this School of Public Health was literally bankrolled by the food industry to get started. We've got wow. Kellogg's, General Mills, everybody else. They just all pitched in and funded the founding of this institution. And so here's Fred Stair sitting in this chair with um, since Kristen Kearns has since un uncovered a lot of the research where he was being funded specifically by the sugar industry to produce papers to minimise the harms of sugar, <laughs> that public health messaging. And then you've got, so you've got this public health messaging on one side and then the other public health messaging is to promote the biblical Garden of Eden diet, fruits, grains, nuts and seeds. They're both wanting to demonise saturated animal proteins and fats so they come together because they're, they're aligned with that. Their symbiotic relationship pushes them to promote the plant-based Garden of Eden diet, you know, plant-biased dietary guidelines because it suits both. Demonizing mm. animal proteins and fats means that sugar couldn't possibly be as bad. You've got to have processed food come back into your diet because where are you going to get your energy and your health right. from? So. Imagine Fred Stair when this guy walks in going, I want to do my doctoral thesis under you and I want to prove vegetarianism without having a vested financial interest. He's doing it because he believes that this is the most important thing he needs to be taking out. Wow. And Fred Stair is going, fantastic. So they started producing their thesis papers in the 1950s and they were taken through to the American Dietetic Association. They were taken through to the AMA. Um, all of these started to look at these research papers. That was the start of really coming back into, um, you know, creating this vegetarian option. And then the American Dietetic Association said around the 1960s, they had a lot of women wanting to do a vegetarian diet, a vegan diet hippie sort of movement coming in yeah. so they went straight to the college of medical evangelists <laughs> and asked them to start their dietetics program to start creating resources for them and then kathleen zolba became the head of the american dietetic association as a devout seventh day adventist and this is where this movement's really started to take effect and i think i jumped from my sorry, from the 2020 US Dietary Guidelines. So then you've got a guy called Joan Sabat, and he sat on the US 2020 Dietary Guidelines as a devout Adventist um, a professor at the Loma Linda University. And the concern was that not only was he part of the panel, but he was on the panel of determining saturated fat, how much saturated fat we should be eating. Uh, that's a whole other <laughs> ball and, of wax. And he's a man who's believes that we should not be eating any animal proteins zero. or fats, yeah. zero. And he was pushing the zero as part of this dietary guideline committee. He wrote, so I was, I was doing a lot of research. Gary spoke about my research for the first time in 2017. We went over to the CrossFit Games and we actually spoke in Michigan, which is just down the road from Kellogg's Battle Creek. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so it, was, it was an interesting time. Gary wanted to speak about my research first because I guess I'd kept it under wraps for about two years until I had enough information to say, I can honestly say that this is historic. This is history. Uh, you know, yes. I'm not just, it's not just, um, this is all stuff you can find. This. Like it's, it's all Google. <clears throat> you can go on Google, you can find it. It's yeah. not, it's not, and hidden. they've you just produced have to look it. for it. It's yeah. out there. Since day Adventist church are very proud and they own this. So after Gary spoke about my research, Joan Sabatin and, and a group of three or four others from Loma Linda University wrote a paper called The Global Influence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Diet. And say, wow. They own it. And you can just read that one paper. A lot of the early writings of Ellen 
have not been reproduced. So you have to look at someone like Dudley Canwright's work. He worked for the church. He was an early convert and he worked for Ellen G. White. He left the church very disheartened after he started to realize that a lot of her work had no basis or you know was plagiarized a whole lot of things so if you go back and look at him at his work you'll understand a lot more it's very detailed so i'm not going to go into all of that now but yeah the church is protecting their prophetess and while i appreciate there are people who want to believe in her words and her health reform she decided that the public health messaging was integral to the church Medical evangelism is the right arm of the church, the health reform message, which is fruits, grains, nuts, and seeds, the God-appointed diet for man. This is the entering wedge. And I, I've seen it written over and over and over again that where you could not necessarily take the Bible or, or their interpretation of the Bible, LNG writes writings necessarily into different countries or convert the secular people, they specifically target cities they take their health message in, they provide hospitals, they provide clinics, they provide this because talking to people about health and well-being and diet is a much easier sell and entering wedge into then starting to talk about the church than wow. just purely going in with a Bible. And so if I look at what's happening here in Australia, as I say, the actual church has a very small footprint, but everybody is a wheat bix kid. Wow. We have bought into their health and well-being messaging. Sanitarium here provide resources for our general practitioners. Just with a click of the button, they print out Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing resources branded, telling people to eat fruits, grains, nuts and seeds, uh, a little bit of lean meat in some of them, you know, because it can't totally look like you're only selling your products. But, you know, this messaging is coming via the dietitians, via the general practitioners. They've been heavily involved in um, sponsoring the Dietitians Association of Australia. They're involved with partnerships with our Heart Foundation, the Diabetes Association. They're taking their messaging out into the South Pacific, which has one of the highest rates of type 2 diabetes in the world. They've got a, a campaign called the 10,000 Toes Campaign, supported by Sanitarium, and what they call their CHIP program, which is the Complete Health Improvement Program. And the facilitator guide, which I came across many years ago, I don't know if you can access it now on the internet or not, but their facilitator guide shows that meat, eggs, and dairy above tobacco, caffeine, and alcohol have the worst possible health outcomes. The red, they're the highest at that end. And of course, fruits, grains, nuts, and seeds are on this side. They're taking that messaging into the Pacific, getting rid of an ancestral diet and telling people to eat these processed foods as well. And if you look at the recipes, they're just sugar, carb, devoid of animal proteins and fats. And these people are already so sick. You know, this is, it's quite scary. So the CHIP program, they are taking that through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, the South Pacific Society of Lifestyle Medicine, these groups, this movement, which I came across because of the expert witness in Gary's case, so he didn't only lead me to sanitarium or to Coca-Cola because his wife works for Ilse, but also to lifestyle medicine. And so looking at this lifestyle medicine movement, they are intent on minimising the harms of processed carbohydrates, not necessarily sugar, but minimizing processed carbs and demonizing animal proteins and fats, specifically in America. They've just written a diabetes bill of rights. And that diabetes bill of rights is an exclusive document, totally ignoring an ancestral diet and recommending people eat fruits, grains, nuts, and seeds to prevent, manage, reverse type 2 diabetes Potentially, they're low calorie, you know, being seriously low calorie may help people lose some weight and maybe get off junk food. So, there may be some improvements in their health, but there's no animal proteins or fats to really get them healthy, in what I believe. And 
honestly, if it was a diabetes bill of rights, then it should cover everything. It should acknowledge the health benefits of all sorts of things, not just be a doctrine written around the beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist church and Coca-Cola, unfortunately, has also gotten in there. So the American College of Lifestyle Medicine was founded in 2003 on the campus of the Loma Linda University, which is owned by the church. A group of doctors, passionate, and I believe completely sincere in their beliefs to improve health outcomes. So they've not gone into it to be bad or be nasty, but their belief system denies me my health because it, there's a perceived conflict of interest because they believe in Ellen G. White's writings telling me that I'm not allowed to eat animal proteins and fats because it's sinful. Mm. And, and and this is the concern going through. They have created a global lifestyle, um, a lot of this, the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance, and they're running exams, 22 countries around the world, based on the beliefs of Ellen G. White. And they write over and over again, this is evidence-based medicine, evidence-based medicine, but their evidence base is the Bible and Ellen G. White's writings. And it is honestly their true belief system is coming through here. And they, they can't see the role of animal proteins and fats. You look on their website or up till November last year, and they, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, have done an incredible lot of resources for people who want to follow a vegan or vegetarian diet. And they state vitamin B12 can only be found from animal proteins and fats. They even acknowledge that you know seaweed and spirulina and different things may have traces, but you're not going to be able to get enough bioavailable vitamin B12 from those. So you have to supplement. Well, the third world countries can't afford to supplement. They can't no. get supplements. No. So they're taking their messages into the third world, South Pacific right now, and they can't supplement. Prior to November last year, when this website has been altered and come down prior to November, their website stated in this vitamin B12 resource page that why, if we're supposed to eat fruits, grains, nuts, and seeds, God appointed diet of man from the Garden of Eden, why is vitamin B12 not available in those foods? And they suppositioned within this article that vitamin B12 was in the tree of life, which was taken away from Adam and Eve. And so that's why it was available in animal proteins and fats and why you can't get it currently in on earth. But once we go back to heaven, we will get the tree of life again. And so you won't need to eat animal proteins or fats in heaven because you'll be able to get your B12 from the tree of life again. That's what on, are we that was supposed to do in the meantime? Wow, that's insane. Yeah. And, and so wow. it, I can't explain how influential Ellen G. White's writings have been on a church that is now the second largest educator in the world and probably has one of the largest healthcare systems in the world when you consider all the clinics that they run, their hospital systems, their education and their educational messaging, and then this American College of Lifestyle Medicine or the Lifestyle Medicine Movement. If you Google the Seventh-day Adventist Church and Lifestyle Medicine, you'll see articles stating they want to be the leaders in lifestyle medicine around the world. The British Society of Lifestyle Medicine and the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine are probably the most secular. They're not as influenced by the Seventh-day Adventist Church per se, but they run the CHIP program. They educate people on the CHIP program. They send people to the board review manual, which has been written by Seventh-day Adventists. They send people to the exams, which have been written by Seventh-day Adventists and by people who are attached to Coca-Cola. And now they've created this Lifestyle Medicine Education Collaborative, which is a, which is a medical education, not only promoting fruits, grains, nuts and seeds, but demonizing animal, so, so not only demonizing saturated fat, which has happened for the last 50 years, yes. but now also demonizing animal proteins in the diet. And if that medical education, which is already in about eight universities in America, 
including Harvard and Stanford. They're running wow. trials of it and promoting this CHIP program. They're trying to get it into medical education here in Australia. And that's why my hashtag is be noisy with me. This can't mm. happen. No, absolutely not. Why, why aren't we questioning where this medical education, the basis for it is, you look at who's written the medical education, the lifestyle medicine education collaborative. And it's a collaboration between members of the Seventh-day Adventist church with a very devout set of beliefs. And it's been created by um, people who are heavily involved in Coca-Cola's exercises medicine. And they want people to write prescriptions. They want doctors to write prescriptions for people to move more, eat less meat. And, and that's, that's the whole basis of it. Exercise is medicine, lifestyle medicine, write prescriptions to, so people move more and eat less meat. It's phenomenal. Wow. It's, you know, and you try to talk with someone about, you know, how for me, I have a very personal story of how I transformed my health with meat, you know, and it was, I was terrified of it. And I, because I, that's the messaging out there. And it's so, it's so insidious. I have family members who, you know, have obese children and it's hard for me to stand mm -hmm. back and watch and have conversations. And they're like, oh, I'm feeding my child healthy. We're eating um, cereals and juice and, you know, oatmeal, we're doing oatmeal. And mm. it's like, what about bacon and eggs for breakfast for your child? Why mm. not get their blood sugar nice and stable first thing in the morning, give them energy for the day mm -hmm. and they run on nice clean fuel, but that's out of the question, you know, it's, and, and so this whole, um, vegan or vegetarian for health message is so convoluted. And, you know, my husband and I talk about it all the time is like the studies that show meat as this unsaturated fat as this horrible thing are all epidemiology. You know, it's, it's correlation. It's not causation. This, and this messaging that you told us so brilliantly and so eloquently about the history of where this messaging come, comes from, how it got into our system has been beaten into us so much that if you look at someone who has, you know, done a vegetarian diet versus someone yeah. who maybe has been eating a lot of meat, you know, we've been told that meat is bad. So this person who is eating meat is probably also eating a bun and French fries and yes. a milkshake. <laughs> they're probably drinking, they're probably smoking, they're probably not sleeping well, they're not taking care of themselves because they haven't been buying into this larger message of what really health should be. And that's right. And a lot of people who adopt veganism or vegetarianism have gone in into it looking for health. Yes, that's what so I did. I, I, com yeah, <laughs> yeah. I completely agree. And so they're looking at how they can protect their bodies and how they can make themselves healthier. So they rarely smoke, you know, and they're mm -hmm. you know, unlikely to drink a lot. And right. as you say, they don't eat all the junk food and they reduce other things. So it's very, it's very hard to pick out the epidemiology, which I believe most epidemiological studies have been either funded by the food industry, the pharmaceutical industry, or have been achieved by Seventh-day Adventist church members. So yeah. then there's no conflict of interest financially. They don't have to write down that they have a belief system because the Sunshine Act only asks you to put down financial conflicts of interest or potential conflicts. Mm. So, you know, you've got Joan Sabat who's done a study, I think in 2017, called Beans Over Beef. And he's written this whole article on how important it is to get rid of meat out of your diet. And it's become headlines around the world and they've cited and cited it. But it comes from the basis of a belief system that he has, a personal belief system, an ideology that he follows and I don't follow that ideology. So I'm being misled. I'm, I'm reading his research through the lens of a Seventh-day Adventist believer, a follower of that church, rather than a scientific lens. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the concern going forward. We need to start questioning who's writing this research, who's funding the research and what belief they have that could be, you know, misinterpreting it. If somebody was to write a paper demonizing bacon because they follow the Jewish faith, 
Mm. Well, most people would understand that that messaging is coming from a personal and an ideological belief as well. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church also believe that pork is an unclean food. So you go back to where did the World Health Organization come to all their conclusions about processed food when you think the processing of food happened back in uh, Mesopotamia, back in the beginning of civilization. They were drying meats, they were drying fish, they were salting these foods. Mm. That was the first preservation of meat and the processing going right back into Europe, processing all those sausages and those meats, they weren't getting cancer back then. You know, what, what is this fear? And the fear is the highly processed meats that have got the added polyunsaturated oils, that have got additives, got chemicals, got all these other things. They're the concern, not the true processed meats, which we have honestly eaten for centuries. And the Seventh-day Adventist church was so excited. The head of their health ministries, um, Peter Landless, just came out so excited when that red meat and processed meat causes cancer messaging came about. And they were all over the thing. So I think people have to really start to consider where this messaging, where the guidelines are using, what research are they using. So there's multiple layers to the plant bias messaging and the demonization of animal proteins and fats. And I don't believe it's come from science. I don't think so either. And it it just, I appreciate this depth of research you've done. I do have a question because, you know, some of my friends that are vegetarian or vegan, they are animal lovers and they do it because they are, they don't want to eat an animal. They think it's bad and immoral, but you know, the other side of that, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on that is just kind of, and they don't want to do environmental damage. They've been told about how mm-hmm. much, you know, the cows and the, the things are, are damaging our environment. And, you know, I, I try to explain that what monocropping is doing to our environment and how mm-hmm. many deaths happen when we're monocropping, you know, all the gophers and deer and rabbits and you and know. the microorganisms, Gary's, yeah. Gary got a, a, um, a, a cup full of cow manure and said, do you know how many microorganisms are in this bit of manure or in this soil that's below it once it decomposes? Like this is natural fertilizer. Mm. So I think the first thing we need to do is really help people understand how integral animal agriculture is to not only the health of our planet and our soil yes in comparison to um chemical fertilizers and and taking the animals off that soil like it's it's imperative that we keep animals where they're supposed to be and some of the factory farming you know it's not what i would consider no. um something that's good and certainly not something that i would want to endorse some of the i agree agriculture uh, sorry the the factory farming that's happening. But in Australia, in Tasmania specifically, I've got cows outside my window Mm. and there's no way they are polluting or causing the global warming that the fossil fuels are. And NASA did a really interesting um, heat map. You can Google their their latest heat map. And it's all targeted over where all the fuels are burning, the coal and the fossil fuels. It's not out in the paddocks where these cows are in front of me. So I think that's number one. And again, as I said, I've gone back in time looking at religion. The Dalai Lama mm-hmm. got sick eating a vegan food. Yeah, Didn't he want eats to meat harm. now. <laughs> he has to eat meat for his health. Yes. So, so people can be very principled about their things, but it's not worth risking our own health. So how do we support farmers that are really considering their animals. And I think Sacred Cow was a brilliant documentary. I'd yes. probably recommend yes. it. <laughs> um, looking at young people who are really trying to consider how they can farm more ethically mm-hmm. and organically and, and utilise that regenerative power of yes. animals with their, with their farm. So that would be the first consideration. 
how do we support local farmers so they can build up and we don't need to use as many factory farms? It's not going to be possible for everyone. And so we can have a lot of ideals. You go back and some of the Buddhist monks, and I'm, so I'm not, I think moral gymnastics I've been reading about. You know, we can have moral mm -hmm. gymnastics. Gary and I go, we've got a fantastic house. We were able to source, you know, the clay from a local um, quarry. And, you know, we've done really important things here that we believe are environmentally sustainable. We've tried to really access a lot of things from local people to build the house that we've built and it's got a really high rating. And so we've got solar and we've got recycled water and we're doing all of those things. But in fairness, our moral gymnastics are that haven't we done a great thing, but not every single person in Launceston can do the same thing. We'd have no quarry left, you know. So yeah, you also, you can appease your own mind, but we've done all these great things, but not everyone can do it. And it's not blaming everyone else that they can't do it. So I think we have to consider that even the Buddhist monks who don't want to kill an animal will fish and pull a fish out of the water. Not all of them, but some of them have been pull a fish out and then the fish dies on its own because it can't breathe. Mm. You know, how do we get through our moral gymnastics? Like the Dalai Lama had to go, well, I actually need to eat meat for my health. You know, I need to do this. A lot of um, the Eastern religions go use yak butter and yak milk. Yes. They might not use a cow. So the moral gymnastics, well, there's a lot of yaks up here. They live and we, and we let their calves have milk, but we have what's left over. Well, they're obviously producing enough milk that there's milk left over. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not just enough milk for their babies. They're producing enough milk. So they're being milked after they've fed their babies to create then enough milk for other people to also be able to access that milk. I, I think moral gymnastics is a really interesting conversation to have with people you know how far will you go and how far won't you if we can create a better health for ourselves and a better health for the animals and a better health for the soil and for our planet that means decreasing medication and how yes. do we create medication how do we create things so we have to make more more than just a choice about do we eat a piece of meat or not are we eating something that's like sanitarium's producing this wonderful thing called up and go and it's just it's a chemical shitstorm, and it's packaged mm. and it's small and so where does the packaging come from where does that packaging go you know it's it's much bigger than just eating some meat we've we've got some great um a group of guys called provenir on the east coast of australia now new south wales and victoria and they these three guys are going around and doing what they've recommended in sacred cow they're they are going to farms and butchering these animals ethically and sustainably. They just, they really care about what they're doing and they're considering tip to tail. Yes. When did we stop eating organ meats? Using the whole animal. Yeah. Yeah. Using I just got a farm animal. order yesterday and I got chicken backs, chicken feet. I got all the parts because <laughs> I'm going to make some amazing broths. We're about to hit fall and I'll make some really amazing broths that are nutrient dense and very nourishing for the family and put them in the freezer. And that's, you know, what we have for soups in the winter. And we have forgotten how to use the entire animal. There's, there's so we've much forgotten in because we've been told not to right? Look that the dietary guidelines. Dirty. Yeah, exactly. There's not an, an organ meat on there. And even in our indigenous dietary guidelines, there's nothing. And Indigenous cultures, ancestral diets eat the entire animal. Where's yes. this waste? We're wasting an animal and buying waste food. <laughs> Soy is a waste product. A lot of it is a waste product of yes. things that were being used in the in the car industry to begin with. You know, so the sludge, the things like that, you go, I think we have to really reconsider, we have to reconnect with our food supply. And I think if people can help reconnect with their food supply and there is some moral gymnastics, there has to be about what we decide. But if we go to a supermarket and we eat a packet of cereal, as you say, that's potentially monocropped and killed so many animals, but we don't see it, right. and we're eating a crispy bit of crunchy cornflake, then you know, 
and it's been gymnastics. flown and you know <laughs> the environmental damage of flying it across the country and all that stuff yeah. when you you know here in the u.s we have a website it's u.s and canada it's www.eatwild.com and okay. you can put in your zip code and find all the farms that are around you and mm -hmm. that's what I encourage people to do instead of, like you said, going to the store, buying the cereal, just because we don't see how yes. many rabbits and how many rats and how many other things and how much soil, like you said, the microorganisms the in the soil would, were destroyed. Yes. That you just, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, you know, and there's yes. no diet that is devoid of death unfortunately we want there right. to be but it just doesn't exist so like you said with the mental gymnastics i feel like we have to find what's going to be best best for our bodies so that we're healthy and we're capable yeah. and we don't go into sick care and then consider what's really best for the environment really do the research instead of falling mm -hmm. prey to the propaganda that's Yes. That's what's so frustrating to me is all the propaganda. It's just so insidious. And then insidious. understanding that propaganda is protecting profits, as in financial profits, and potentially protecting a profit. Yes. And who would have thought? I mean, you think about the Catholic Church. They had a lot of fishermen. People weren't buying enough fish, so they made Fish Friday happen. You know, they wanted to encourage uh. Catholics to eat fish on a Friday to use what was being brought in that there were not enough people were eating fish well that's a brilliant idea you know, encourage people to eat what's coming in fresh seasonally locally and right. encouraging them fish but we're following you know good friday when when people are told not to eat flesh meat and things so a lot of people would eat fish and not eat animal proteins or fats on that particular day so we are influenced by religion consciously subconsciously about what we eat there's fasting involved with a lot of religions mm -hmm. and there are a lot of ideas about what to eat and what not to eat interestingly i've done a big deep dive back into leviticus and deuteronomy from the bible which is where judaism have their rules but there's also a lot of ceremonial rules about the meat that they eat they don't say don't eat meat you just have to prepare it in a certain way or um present it so the seventh day adventist church have, don't use any of the ceremonial rules. They've just gone strictly back to the biblical Garden of Eden diet. And, but in this Leviticus and Deuteronomy, they also talk about plants and they talk about fruit trees. Mm. And under the laws, the ceremonial laws, you're not allowed to touch a fruit tree for at least four years and some of them seven. And, and it makes sense. They made those laws so that the tree had time to establish itself before people were picking the fruit. You know, a lot of the things made sense about the ceremonial laws of preparing the foods and potentially why they had clean and unclean foods back in that day. But when you consider society now and how we prepare foods and how we grow foods and all sorts of other things, it, 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 there's different times. So the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist church have gone all the way back to the beginning of Genesis and saying, this is how God said we have to eat and there's no other way, this is it. And they are influencing our dietary and health guidelines and supporting associations to further push this same messaging. I think we, we need to be very aware that it isn't just vested interests and financial, but it's also very much based on ideology, this demonization of animal proteins and fats in our diet. And if that's the reasoning, then I'm questioning and it makes me start to think, well, what about health? Where's health? The health for ourselves, the health for our soil, the health for our planet, and the health of animals. And yes, and I think it becomes a much easier way to have a discussion. Uh, what you've been talking about as well, but Leah Keith mentioned that same thing. There is no life without death, and she tried so hard to be um, a vegan and keep to her ideals for a very, very long time, and she just got sicker and sicker, and. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being out there and being an advocate for people to understand that the idea of yoga and health doesn't necessarily mean only eating a vegan diet. Yeah. Yeah. It's and truly about health. If you look at some of the ancient texts, 
food of the yogis is milk and honey. You know, that's yeah. what's, it, and I've done it, you know, teaching yoga for 12 years and practicing. And mm -hmm. I really did have to do a deep dive into this because yes. I was very conflicted for a long time. I felt like I was doing the wrong thing. And so, you know, people that you, like you that put their work out there and, and really help us to understand where a lot of this messaging comes from. And when you dig deeper into the literature, into these ancient yoga texts, and mm. I've studied the Rig Veda with, you know, it's an oral tradition that you can only get orally okay. from a teacher. And I've done those, the Vedas wow. and yeah, meat is used as medicine in the Vedas. Yes. And so yes. <laughs> it's th this whole yoga, vegan, vegetarian thing. I feel that you know, it was done to control people, you know, to make them weak, just like the cereal was done to it's, it's an old story yet. It's so well, old it's and also, it's so woven in. We yeah. don't recognize it. I, I would definitely believe some of it's about controlling people and, yeah. and creating a system, but it's also what was there. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's true. Um, so there's a lot of cultures that rely on a, a single goat or a single cow or a yak and, and they cut that around. So they use the dairy products from those animals mm. until they can't, then they slaughter them and then they have that meat, mm. but they can't eat meat all the time because they rely on that animal to provide the dairy for them. Mm. And like, I've got some good friends in India and they said, there's no way we can't have dairy, you know, cheeses and all those things. But if you read Ellen G. White's writings, cheese was almost a banned substance. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> cheese was banned. And she's, and this big push for olive oil that we hear all the time, you know, yeah. with, olive oil's got the most massive health halo over it. Well, Ellen G. White endorsed olive oil because it was a fruit. It was an <sighs> oil that she could get from a fruit. And so she was really big on promoting olive oil. Um, it, you just start to read her things that you think, this is amazing that someone in 1863 who finished school in, when she was nine because she was injured badly and so she never went back to school, someone could be so influential in creating these doctrines that are influencing our lives right now. And, and for me in Australia, having sanitarium actually write resources for my GP to print out for me if I've got type 2 diabetes or if I've wow. got gestational diabetes and, yeah. Um, are these doctors not thinking, but yeah. they don't think because they are spoon fed and, and unfortunately our education system is read, repeat reward. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you question things, wow, you get into big trouble and just ask yeah. my husband. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Well, this has been just absolutely amazing. And I feel like so much information for people that, you know, I, I hope it's going to help people, Number one, just kind of come to terms with looking at their health and then also really understanding the true messaging of what's out there. And I really, you know, I really appreciate all your time today and, you know, where can people so much, find Sarah. you and, and read more of your work if they want to. I've been a little bit quiet on social media. Things are a bit crazy in my household at the moment. We've got children and grandchildren running around uh. with the COVID <laughs> thing. So um, we're... I've been a little bit quiet on there, but um, I am. I have LinkedIn. It's Belinda Fetke on LinkedIn, Belinda Fetke Instagram, Belinda Fetke Twitter. And I've also got, I took over Gary's Facebook page many years ago when he was silenced and he wasn't allowed to be there. So uh. it wouldn't have been what I chose, but it's Belinda Fetke, no fructose. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, when, when Gary was in trouble, I said, you're kidding me. So I crossed out Gary Fetke, no fructose, right? Belinda Fetke, no fructose. And from wow. this day forward, he's not allowed to be on social media. He's now allowed to be back on social media, but he decided he wouldn't go back on Facebook. He's wow. very active on Twitter. So I'm available on those ones. I've got started a website called or www.isupportgary.com. Yes. That was to really take on the medical board and to challenge when they kept saying they wouldn't believe us when I was sending screen grabs of this man working for sanitarium and sending documentation. They just said, no, we don't believe you. So I thought, well, I'll tell everybody else then if you're not going to pay any attention to this. Yeah. And hopefully my I Support Gary website helped get Gary 
cleared, exonerated. It took two years. And yeah, so I'm available on those and I'm actually in the process, which is also why I'm a bit quiet at the moment, of creating a website called justbelindafetki.com because Nina Tyshaws, my gorgeous friend, said to me that my iSpot Gary was a bit like a cottage industry website and she couldn't really reference my work on there because how can you reference I love Gary? <laughs> so, <laughs> so she said, can you try and create something that's a bit more um, or less I support, less I love Gary? So I'm in the process of creating my research without the I love Gary side of it, but he is the reason I started. Um, and yeah, so putting up this work as a Belinda Vecchi, but probably be in the next few months. Hopefully that's up and going. I've started writing some work for that. And there's lots of me around YouTube and different interviews yes. I've done. So. And thank you so much, Sarah, for having me. I yeah, really, thank really you. Thank you so much for being here. This was lovely. And I learned so much today. Thank you. Thank you.